Well, here it is, Conrad Fisher, the author of the best-selling book for the USMLE Step 3, Comlex Level 3, Master the Boards. Now it's time to master every sort of esoteric thing. If it wasn't for the boards, you would never study. We don't talk about no, no, cardia. Oh, we don't, let's see. So what these are is that these are respiratory illnesses. That is a branching Gram positive, partially acid fast, branching, filamentous, gram positive rod. There's nothing like it. It's not exactly a rod, but then it's definitely not a caucus. Nocardia is always an immunocompromised people. Nocardia does not exist in the normal host. No one normal has nocardia in their sputum. And also, what kind of immunocompromised we're talking about here is lymphocyte and neutrophil abnormalities. HIV, lymphocyte, and steroids, lymphocyte, and neutrophil. And besides being in the lung, where else does it go? This is a biopsy and goes in from the lung, also goes to brain and skin, and brain and skin. So first of all, we're going to start off with all respiratory illnesses with a chest CT, chest x-ray, excuse me, then chest CT. But you cannot stain a CT, you cannot culture an MRI, you can't get sensitivities on a nuclear skin. So the most accurate in infection Infectious disease must be a culture. Now, sputum culture is not great. Same as aspergillus, not great. Lacks sensitivity, misses most of them. And we tend to need a biopsy. Be now, remember, if you see candida in sputum, no big deal. Everybody could have candida in their vagina, candida in their sputum, and candida in their stool. But nobody has no cardia and aspergillus just hanging around their sputum. Now, it's atypical, very strange bug, Bactrim, trimethoprim sulfa. Hey, trimethoprim sulfa or carbapenem? How do those fit together? Or minocycline, meaning gets rid of your life-threatening opportunistic infection of nocardia and also cleans up your acne. So not only are you not going to die of this opportunistic infection, you're going to have beautiful, clear skin with minocycline, a branching gram-positive filamentous organism that's weakly acid fast. Now, the other organism that has partial acid fastness is actinomyces, not actinobacillus. Actin Bacillus is a type of culture negative endocarditis. And the single biggest difference is, is that actinomyces can be in people with normal immune systems, not nocardia. Nocardia is always lung, brain, skin, lung, brain, skin, and immunocompromised. It gets inoculated through your face and can go into your chest and into your abdomen and gives you these nifty sulfa granules as it gets shoved into normal tissue. Actinomyces can be part of normal flora. Actinomyces can be in immunocompetent people. Actinomyces gets tested by looking at a stain and a culture. Now, actinomyces is also a filamentous gram-positive organism, but the difference is you're not gonna die from it. Rarely die with it, and you treat it with good old-fashioned penicillin. You're not going to miss sulfur granules. It's going to be easy. Now look at this beautiful stain. Look at this green stuff. What is that when you see that green? The organisms are staining dark. The surrounding tissue is staining a beautiful aquamarine. That's a silver stain. You could use that for pneumocystis. Now, pneumocystis is a strange bug because it's not treated with antifungals, but it's got fungal DNA on the inside. It's got fungal genetics, so it's sort of like a transvestite. At its core, it's a fungus, but it dresses up like a protozoan. Now, histoplasma, blastomycosis, histoplasmosis, blastomycosis, coccidiotomycosis, and crypto coccus are called dimorphic fungi, histoblasto, cryptococci, and they're dimorphic because in the cold at room temperature, 20 degrees centigrade room temperature, they are a mold with spores. But inside of us, they germinate and turn into a yeast. Now that can be difficult for people at the very beginning because overall group name is fungus is fungus. Well, then what's the difference between a mold and a yeast? 
Mold is in the cold and has spores which spreads and give you more. Mold in the cold with spores for more. There is no environmental candida. You're not going to find candida albicans in soil samples. You're not going to find candida albicans inside your refrigerator. Candida albicans need body temperature, 37 degrees temperature. Candida albicans often is in dark moist. It's in warmer, darker moister. You might say, sounds like a nice fresh cake. Mm, no. So these histoblastocryptococci can exist as spores in endemic areas. You see around river valleys where it spreads around. So histoplasmosis is where it's wet. And although that may be the Ohio, Ohio and Mississippi River Valley, it could be in any river valley. And if we are at the University of Ohio, histoplasmosis would be one of the most common infections that you might see. A histoblastocryptococci in immunocompetent people, they all present as a viral syndrome. Aches and pains, a dry cough, maybe a little shortness of breath, but temporary. Aches and pains and myalgias, and it goes away on its own. It doesn't disseminate up into your brain. It doesn't disseminate to the skin or bone or brain unless you're immunocompromised. Histo, blasto, crypto, coxy. They exist as spores in the environment. Then they turn into yeasts in us. What's different? Bat caves, but caves. The key issue is caves. Caves are moist. Moisture drips off the walls because caves exist at the temperature of, oh, I don't know, 55, 60, 65 degrees. So moisture precipitates off the walls of the caves, moist in the bat droppings. They pass through the bat. Now, what else is different about histo? Why do you get palatal and oral lesions? I don't know, but you just do. Why do you get a pancytopenia? Histo also invades the bone marrow. Blasto, crypto, and coxy don't invade the bone marrow. Coccidioidomycosis, coccidioidomycosis, it causes joint pain and erythema nodosum. Coccidioidum is with joint pain and erythema nodosum. Histo doesn't cause joint pain and erythema nodosum. Histo causes a big spleen. So it goes in and goes into your uh, cell production where you make white cells. That's why it can go into the marrow. That's why it causes an enlargement of your spleen. Histo is in wet areas. Coxy is in dry areas. And cryptococcosis, of course, is in pigeon poo. Have you been sniffing a pigeon's ass? Hmm, cryptococcosis. Now, we don't think of it this way because cryptococcus for us is a cause of meningitis in people with AIDS. But people who are HIV negative can get crypto. They just don't know it most of the time. They have an unexposed contact, uh, sorry, unprotected contact with a pigeon's ass, and they get a viral syndrome, and it gets better on its own. It's only in HIV positive people it disseminates into the brain. Histo bone marrow. The others don't go into the bone marrow and cause a pancytopenia. Now, in terms of the lung, anything TB can do, histoplasmosis can do. Anything TB, tuberculosis can cavitate, cavitate, histoplasmosis can cavitate. Hist uh, tuberculosis can cause adenopathy, and histoplasmosis can cause adenopathy. Anything TB can do, histoplasmosis can do inside the lungs. And yes, it does come through with the birds in the trees, but inside of wet areas. Well, look at that blue, green, beautiful stain. The organism stains dark. The organism stains dark. This is a silver stain, Grocot, methenum, and silver. But what's different in diagnostics about histoplasmosis? Of all of them, it's the only one that has a urine antigen. Well, wait a second, I thought cryptococcosis had an antigen. Yes, but not a urine antigen. A urine antigen is only, in terms of fungi, is only for histoplasmosis, because that's not the same thing as Legionella urine antigen. That's a urine antigen. There's also a Pneumococcus urine antigen, but in terms of fungus and yeast, the only one that has a urine antigen is histoplasmosis. And why that's really important is who wants to have to do this lung biopsy? Because a biopsy means I have to go take a piece of your lung. 
Now, so that's why it's much better to do the urine to do the urine testing. Now, for TB, fortunately, it sheds in sputum. Histo doesn't shed in sputum very well. Matter of fact, the dimorphic fungi, histoplasmosis, blastomycosis, cryptococcosis, coccidioidomycosis, all of them primarily enter the body through the lung. However, they're not well detected easily inside sputum. That's why TB can detect it just from an expectorated sputum, but not histoplasmosis, not well, urine antigen. Now, most of these dimorphic fungi, if they're just a limited respiratory illness, they don't need any treatment, they resolve on their own because it's just like a viral syndrome, like you had viral bronchitis or viral uh, the flu with a bronchitis. And so the pulmonary disease usually doesn't need any therapy, it goes away. But they all can disseminate to your brain. And if they're disseminated to other parts of the body, for instance, coccidioidomycosis, meningitis, cryptococcal meningitis, histoplasmosis in the marrow, then it's amphotericin. Now, amphotericin does not have a lot of uses anymore. You have cryptococcus, mucormycosis, and disseminated dimorphic fungi. Because for things like cryptococcus, cryptococcus does not have the 1,3 glucan linkage that the echinocandins treat. Echinocandins, caspofungin, mycofungin, anadula fungin, caspofungin, mycofungin, anadula fungin, caspofungin, mycofungin, anadula fungin, the echinocandins, which are terrific drugs for neutropenic fever, terrific drugs for candida, but useless drugs for the dimorphic fungi because they don't have that linkage in their cell wall. So we're gonna have three types of answers for the dimorphic fungi. Life-threatening, severe, disseminated into your brain, into your marrow. Life-threatening, amphotericin. Just the respiratory illness like a viral syndrome, immunocompetent, no treatment. Then in the middle, in the middle, mild disease, just a little less respiratory problems, mild disease, a little skin, itraconazole. Itraconazole is a drug most of you have never used. Itraconazole is never for severe life-threatening disease. It is for molds that are minor, minor molds. Minor aspergillus, allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillus, minor mold, itra. Histo, minor mold, itraconazole. Now, coccidioidomycosis, you see this bag of sporules? It's like a bag of sporules. That bag of sporules can be very, very dangerous because it's got a tremendous capacity to rupture and float into the air and cover a wide territory, which is a tremendous genetic survival advantage, isn't it? You're out in the desert and dry areas and you're golfing out there in Arizona and What's different about it? Because remember, these spherules break and they go poof, like the dust, dry dust, very widely spread. What's different about coxy from the other dimorphic fungi? Joint pain and skin lesion, desert rheumatism. Remember, only one S in desert, two S's in dessert. Because your dessert, they're so good, you want more than one more than one S. So you have disseminated disease, amphotericin. Localized to the lung, no treatment resolves spontaneously. Moderate disease, itraconazole, fluconazole. Now sputum culture and it can detect it. The problem with cultures, it can be dangerous to the lab because it's so widely disseminated. And serology, that's why we can use serology. And the same way we use a type of serology, it's antigen testing for cryptococcus. Moderate disease, fluconazole, itraconazole, moderate or mild molds, itra, 
moderate or mild molds, itra, and disseminated disease with amphotericin. Echinocansins don't work because the 1,3-glucan linkage is not in dimorphic fungi. Now, blastomycosis is the least common of all of these, and what it does is that blastomycosis goes out into the woods, and it's around vegetation out in the woods in the rural southeast, and the key issue is going to be broad budding yeast. Now, like all of the dimorphic fungi, it goes in as a spore, and it goes in respiratory, histoblasto, crypto, coxy, and to a certain degree, aspergillus goes in as a spore, respiratory. Then it can disseminate. Difference is here, broad budding yeast, you have to be told. There's nothing particularly unique about blastomycosis because all of the dimorphic fungi can cause skin lesions, actually looks like molluscum contagiosum. <gasps> Disseminated disease, amphotericin, or mild and moderate itraconazole. <gasps> Look at that broad bud. Look at that broad blood. And what kind of stain is that? With the beautiful blue-green and the dark silver stain for dimorphic fungi. You'd have to be told broad budding. Now, that's because yeast come out and they get pinched off. Pinched off. Come to very narrow, like twisting a balloon. Yeasts. Oh, I beg your pardon. I never parted, promise you, a rose garden. Rose gardener's disease, sporotrichosis, can happen in normal people. Now, unlike histoblasto, crypto, coxy, histoblasto, crypto, and coxy are very unlikely to disseminate in a normal host. Sporotrichosis can go through the skin in a normal host, and it can be very nasty. It can actually chew off your face. You see, we forget that um, uh, impetigo and erysipelas, we forget that 100 years ago, erysipelas could be a fatal disease. In the pre-antibiotic era, we take these things for granted. So sporotrichosis in places that didn't have access to antifungals could spread around and basically chew off your face with these cutaneous nodules. Now, this, again, is a mold that comes in with spores and the body temperature, it germinates some more. And you heard me about mild molds itra, mild molds itra, because sporotrichosis does not get disseminated enough to need amphotericin, and unlike the other dimorphic fungi, does not go to your brain. It remains a cutaneous disease, a nasty cutaneous disease, but still a cutaneous disease. Mucormycosis is also known as rhizopus. Rhizopus. Now, rhizopus or mucor is never, ever, ever found in a normal person. The closest thing to a normal person with mucor has been recently in COVID in certain parts of the world. Nobody knows why COVID in Asians and in India people got black mold disease, because that was really unusual, because mucor is almost always a disease associated with severe, super out-of-control diabetics, or people who have leukemia, the bone marrow transplant, because this is a truly, truly horrible mold. First of all, this in the mold world is a huge, wide organism. Next, there's no septa in there. There's no septa. Second, you see it's right angle branching, right angle branching, right angle branching. Aspergillus is more narrow branching. Mucor, non-septate hyphae with right angle branching. Non-septate, broad, wide angle, right angle branching. And it grows in general in people. For us, it's going to be a person who's in DKA, who's got very high sugar, because yeasts and molds like to grow in sugar. And what mucor also does is it infarcts off the blood supply, so the blood vessels can't deliver white cells to kill it off, or antifungals. Now, defroxamine, why would defroxamine increase the risk? Defroxamine is one of the iron chelators that's sometimes used for hemochromatosis. Well, when defroxamine mobilizes iron in you, defroxamine 
makes it so that the iron can feed the bug because there's increased iron turnover with infections. That's why, if you remember, the gallium scan follows iron metabolism. <gasps> Cephidericol is a cephalosporin antibiotic that binds iron, a siderophore, and is extraordinarily powerful antibiotic. So when you mobilize iron, it increases the risk of mucormycosis chewing through your nasal canal and eating your eyeballs while it's going towards your brain to kill you. Ay, 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 ay. Mucormycosis is an amazing infectious disease emergency. Many people will not see a case more than once every 10 or 20 years. Uh, and I saw one a few months ago. The guy came in with DKA. Now, the intensive care unit sees 5, 10 DKAs a week. So by itself, a diabetic ketoacidosis, a cookbook, could be managed by computer program. But the guy had eye pain. And between the morning and the afternoon, his eye problem worsened to the point where he started having pain on moving his eyes. And I go, hey dude, open your mouth. Let me look at the roof of your mouth. And we shine a light up there and the guy's got a little bit of black stuff, a little bit, in the top of his mouth and his palate. And then you go, run, run, run. And we got him transferred to a specialized place where you need some very specialized equipment to operate on a sinus like that. The kind of specialized sinus equipment in the operating room to be able to resect a large part of the sinuses. Now, this isn't the guy because the whole point about doing this class and doing this test, the whole point about learning this is that you may be the only one to notice, hey, that out of control diabetic has got eye pain and the eye pain's progressing, and now his eye's not moving so well. Open your mouth. And he had just a little black stuff on his palate. And you wanna recognize that because you wanna recognize the little black stuff on his palate before this happens. If it looks like the face got infarcted off, it's cause the face got infarcted off. Because those wide, non-septate, right angle branching hyphae chew through the face in hours. Amphotericin and surgical debridement. Now, the difference about these two azoles, posaconazole and isavuconazole, is that they have mucor covering capacity and a little bit of aspergillus too. Now, I know that this can seem very, very daunting at your level because you're like, Dr. Fisher, I, 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 I've used and heard of fluconazole I've heard of itraconazole, but do I really have to know posa and isavuconazole? And I go, well, you've really got to learn your azoles because if you use and, or work with the wrong asshole, you're gonna get your face destroyed off here. Like this person's, most of their sinus got destroyed and even the base of their eye and people lose their eyeballs. Now, what is this? Well, one, it's Pope Francis. Second, this is an aspergillium. An aspergillium is what the priests use in certain religions to spread holy water. Holy water to my lips, yes. And so the people who saw this organism microscopically at first said, you know what that organism looks like? That organism looks like an aspergillium. Let's call it aspergillus. Why is it jealous? I don't know. Now, there's two types of aspergillus. One is the allergic type in osmotics, and you get some brown flex sputum, and it gets caught up there and sort of just colonizes out in cystic fibrosis. And you have migratory fleeting infiltrates on an x-ray once it's here, and then it's there, and it's here, and it's there, and it's here, and it's there. And um, you can treat with steroids and some itraconazole. There's two types of aspergillus infections. One is it's sort of colonizing out in asthmatics and getting clogged up in cystic fibrosis. And you look for these um, uh, antigens called, in the aspergillus, a unique word for antigen, precipitans. 
uh, and antibodies and a little IgE or specific antibodies. And skin testing for aspergill. So there's two types. One is the colonizing mild bronchitis focal type pneumonia. And I use the word pneumonia uh, guardedly because in allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillus, you're not getting hypoxic. Um, you're not getting a whole lobe destroyed. You're having basically an, an allergic reaction to aspergillus that just gets stuck there, giving you a high eosinophil count. And it's so much inflammatory as it is an infection, an infection, an inflammatory, inflammatory, an infection, an allergic reaction that we use steroids. We use steroids. Now, the most common wrong answer is thinking, of course, inhaled steroids must work because you're delivering it directly there. I mean, why wouldn't inhaled steroids? You're delivering it directly into the lungs. And I would have thought that too, that you're delivering it right into the lungs. It should work, except it's not strong enough. Inhaled steroids are not potent, not powerful, not strong enough to be able to control this disease. So you have to use systemic steroids. And because it's not disseminated, it's not life-threatening, it's not causing cavities, it's not chewing through your lungs, causing a halo sign and an infarction, it's not destroying permanently major tissue, it's just irritating. Itra, voriconazole. Now, voriconazole, another asshole? Yes, another azole. And vori is the number one aspergillus azole. Not needed for everybody, because we said mild and moderate fungi, mild and moderate molds, itraconazole. Vori is for invasive aspergillus, more severe diseases. So allergic bronchopulmonary, you're going to see an asthmatic or cystic fibrotic who's got fleeting infiltrates running around, aspergillus precipitins or skin testing, and you remember not to use inhaled steroids because that's a very different disease than invasive aspergillus. That's called a halo sign. That's called a halo sign. And a halo sign means a halo like what you'd see around angelic beings like me or around stars. The halo around it is part of the invasiveness of the aspergillus where it's spreading out into surrounding tissues, destroying permanently lung. Allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillus a little infiltrate here, a little bit infiltrate there. You cough, you have some wheezing, but it's not going to destroy your lungs. Invasive aspergillus is rapidly progressive, permanently wrecking your lung. Now, invasive aspergillus, of which I have seen a lot because it's in leukemia and bone marrow transplant patients, it's tremendously difficult to diagnose without a biopsy. And so we have a couple of tests. See, galactomannan is a non-specific test of fungi. Now, galactomannan is in a lot of fungi, and as a matter of fact, many of you have eaten it. You've eaten it? I've eaten galactomannan? Yes, galactomannan has been a food additive for many years. Galactomannan makes liquidy things that are thin into more firm, more solid. It's added into lousy and cheap ice cream to make it firm. It's added into processed sauces and soups to give them a thickness. It's a food thickener. Galactomannan has been used in the food industry for a very long time. Beta-D-glucan is what echinocandins inhibit. Caspofungin, mycofungin, anadulafungin, caspofungin, mycofungin, anadulafungin. Beta D glucan is the, okay, the 1 3 glucan linkage is in the cell wall, but again, not completely specific. PCR is specific. And so to avoid having to do a biopsy and Doing a biopsy of the lung in an immunocompromised leukemic person who might have had chemotherapy and a bone marrow transplant, that's not wonderful, is it? So if we do these tests, which can be done on blood or on bronchoalveolar lavage, two of these tests 
can give you your diagnosis, and we can know that it's invasive aspergillus without having to do the biopsy. If the question says what's most accurate, it is a biopsy, but we'd like to avoid it. Now, the next thing is, you see that little line there, that dark line? See that dark line? See that dark line? Those dark lines, that's called a septa. And a septa in these hyphae tells you it's aspergillus and tells you it's not mucor mycosis. Now, sputum misses most, but if you saw it there, normal people don't have aspergillus. Aspergillus can never can be considered a contaminant, a colonizer, or a, pa a passenger. Now, for 50 years, the treatment of choice was amphotericin. However, it is not. Compared to voriconazole and isovuconazole, amphotericin has more adverse effects and less efficacy. Voriconazole, isobuconazole, and the echinocannons have both better efficacy, meaning half the amount of mortality. If you answer amphotericin, the person is twice as likely to die. Amphotericin has twice the mortality for invasive aspergillus. What's left for amphotericin? They, mucormycosis, cryptococcus, and some of the widely disseminated dimorphic fungi. Isavuconazole. Look, if it wasn't for step three, you probably never uh, studied this, and it's not like this came out last week. We don't give you drugs that came out last week, or, the, or last year, or the year before that. And isavuconazole is almost 10 years old. Now, that may seem to be a little overlap with amphotericin, because it is. It does better, though, with less adverse effects. Now, you don't have to know very much about Candida auris. Candida auris, if that sounds like the word ear, is because it was found in a Japanese ear. Now, Candida auris is, uh, the only reason you have to know about it is because we're scared of Candida auris because it happens in immunocompromised people who are in hospital for hospitalized immunocompromised people, and we isolate people for it because we're afraid of it spreading to other people that it might really hurt. So there's not a large knowledge base. You just have to know, hey, it's in hospitalized immunocompromised people, and you isolate them to keep it from going into others. We're more just scared of what it might give, that it might cause disseminated disease in the vulnerable. And the other part about it is that the echinocannons, caspofungin, mycofungin, anadulofungin, caspofungin, mycofungin, and the do the fungin. The echinocannons are really great for all the candidates. They really are for the candidates, and no reason to use amphotericin. Whew. Ooh, weren't those all so exciting, so special? Mm hmm. Oh, yeah, step three is good. Without step three, you'd never do this. Put yourself under more responsibilities.